The world first knew him as one of Eastern Europe's most powerful writers. Then Czechoslovakia's Václav Havel got real power. He was in the vanguard of the wave that swept his country into the post-communist era. And he won real political power when three years ago today, he was chosen president. But freeing his Czechoslovakia from communism proved far easier than keeping it together. As Czechs and Slovaks go their separate ways, it's back to being citizen Havel. But that doesn't mean his work is over. Prague. A fairy tale city ruled from a castle. At noon each day, the traditional changing of the presidential guard. The trumpets blare, the rifles shine. It's a great show, but on this December day, it does seem a bit forlorn. The castle is empty. The guards are marching for a president who is no longer in power. For a country that no longer exists. If the world knows where Czechoslovakia is, it's in large part because they know who Václav Havel is. Does it sadden you that soon Czechoslovakia will no longer exist? Until the very last minute, we struggled to determine whether or not we could find a way to live together in a common country. I wouldn't say that we have lost a country. It has simply changed. But we're still at home here. Salman Rushdie said your books gave him strength and inspiration. Yes. yes. He became a president, but he was always a poet. Havel's books of plays and philosophy are known around the world, but he has chosen to live his life in the center of Prague. Our house. This. This is. And this is from your grandfather or your father? Your grandfather. grandfather built it. Havel's grandfather established the family fortune in Czechoslovakia, but Havel's pampered existence was shattered in 1948 when communists took over. Havel took refuge in writing theater of the absurd and became that country's most important playwright. His belief that the truth holds a political power took him from plays to politics. In 1977, he and other dissidents founded human rights organization Charter 77. His plays and books were banned. Havel was watched, harassed, and finally imprisoned after he turned down the communist regime's offer to leave the country. Six months after his last release from prison, he and a group of friends founded the political movement Civic Forum. It was 1989, and communist regimes were crumbling across Eastern Europe. Within weeks, Havel negotiated a peaceful end to four decades of communist rule in Czechoslovakia. The poet turned dissident had turned hero. Day and night, Wenceslas Square resounded with the chant, Havel to the castle, Havel for president. Uh, Jerzy Dinsbier was at Havel's side through the years of dissent and weeks of negotiation. He believes the Velvet Revolution represented a triumph of his friend's personal values. He is always very polite and, and, uh, and uh, he listens to the people, but he has unbreakable moral ground and whoever touches this ground uh, immediately feels his strength. <laughs> In December 1989, Havel was sworn into the largely ceremonial position of president. He promised to use the power he had not for his own political future, but for the birth of a new Czechoslovakia based on tolerance, respect for human rights, and for a new kind of politics. 
Šlo mi o politiku, která není... I was concerned about the kind of politics that is not mainly a technology for competing for power, but a way of serving citizens, of serving those close to one, a politics that raises the common interest over party or personal interests. This doesn't mean that I want to hover somewhere above politics, like God over the waters. I'm inside politics, of course. Havel became the darling of the international scene, a playwright who wanted to put morality back into politics. A politician who even rock stars wanted to be seen with. A president who dared to have fun. But Havel warned his critics he was no pushover. If anyone thinks that the office of president has been filled by a poet and a naive dreamer, he should remember that even poets have teeth. People loved it. You know, someone has said that, uh, that being president was your guiltiest pleasure. Has, has the job, the celebrityhood, the power seduced you? On the contrary, I've been somewhat encumbered by the disadvantages of power. What are the disadvantages of being president? I could spend a long time talking about them. I could start with the morning, with the fact that you have to wear a tie every day. If that's the worst thing about being president, you have to wear a tie. <laughs> when I've worn sweaters and t-shirts all my life, you have to shave every day, smile, keep the conversations going, watch every word, because there are always curious cameras staring at you and photographers. But above all, politics is an endless process in which you never have the feeling you've actually accomplished anything. It's not like a bricklayer putting up a wall. At noon, he can see part of the wall already built, and he can relax over a beer and look at what he's done. Unlike the bricklayer, Havel's creation was crumbling. The Slovaks in the eastern part of the country wanted out. Havel offered them a new constitution and more power. It wasn't enough. He called for a referendum to let the people decide. Parliament turned him down. At a rally in Slovakia last year, Havel was driven from the stage by an egg-throwing, jeering crowd of Slovak separatists. It was the beginning of the end for Havel and for Czechoslovakia. In last June's election, Slovakia's Vladimir Mečiar, a former communist, ran a popular pro-separatist campaign. From the castle in Prague, Havel spoke directly to the people on the eve of the election. He implored them not to vote for those with dictatorial tendencies, meaning Mečiar. He urged them to support those who wanted to keep the country together. Mečiar won and became prime minister of Slovakia. Havel put the best face on things and asked Mečiar to try to form a new government with the prime minister of the Czech region, Václav Klaus. But Mečiar wanted to be free of the Czechs, and free enterpriser Klaus wanted to be free of the poor Slovaks. All Havel could do was make the announcement of the backroom deal. Instead of negotiating a new government, they had negotiated the separation of the country. As a dissident, your aim was to get rid of totalitarianism. You wanted to give people back their dignity, return their human and civil rights. Don't you find it a little ironic that two guys decide to break up the country and, and they don't bother asking the country? I would certainly not say that the country was divided by these two men. But, but ultimately it was, it was extraordinarily undemocratic, wasn't it? The polls showed that Czechs and Slovaks didn't want to separate. Two million people signed a petition demanding a referendum. Where is their voice? I struggled two years to have such a referendum held. It wasn't possible to get the idea through Parliament, partly because it was blocked by those who were afraid of the results, who were afraid it would turn out in favor of a common state, when what they wanted was to divide the country. 
You know, there is a parallel in Canada. The prime minister who is elected wanted to make amendments to the constitution, so he asked the people. There was a referendum. It was difficult, but he asked. Yes, I repeat that a referendum would have been better, but you can't call in question the results of the election and say that someone is arbitrarily dividing the country. Perhaps I overestimate the power you had as president, but the world admired you, your people trusted you. Could you not have used that incredible moral authority to demand a referendum? No, I'm a Democrat. The political parties in Slovakia that got an absolute majority in Parliament made it part of their program to make Slovakia independent. There may be some who wish a common state, but they would have to express that will somehow. Have you ever read any Slovak petition against the separation of the country with a single signature on it? Last July, the president's flag was lowered as Havel left the castle for the last time. The Slovak separatist parties in parliament had blocked his re-election. Havel had won the hearts of the people, but not the politicians. He wanted to eliminate the politics of self-interest and intrigue. Instead, it had eliminated him. <laughs> I'm free, joked Havel, but it was a bittersweet farewell. He's a wonderful moral authority figure. Uh, he has even uh, made wonderful suggestions about how the country should be run. Some Havel's English translator, Paul Wilson, has known Havel for 20 years. He says Havel's greatest strength turned into his greatest weakness. Uh, the problem is that he consistently re refuses, partly for the reasons uh, that, that he doesn't like, partisan nature of politics, he's refused to get involved in party politics. And un unfortunately, at the level of, of the federation or the national level, uh, it doesn't work. Havel just didn't appreciate political institutions, says former member of parliament Jan Sokol. And that's a problem when you're president. I think he underestimated the necessity to lobbying, to lobby, to take this one aside and that one aside and say, you look, this would be a good thing, and so on. Yes? And in this sense, I think he would have been perhaps a bit successful. Havel is not giving up. He is running for president of the new Czech state. The people still love him, but they won't be voting for him. Parliament turned down his proposal that he be elected. And with no constitutional power, all Havel may end up doing is shaking hands, signing autographs and cutting ribbons. Some observers say he should not run for president of the new state when he failed to achieve his ideals as president of the old one. The circumstances surrounding the division were circumstances that he might have influenced, although he claims that he couldn't. And I think that, uh, to, to a certain extent, he and the politicians around him have failed to hold this country together, and that failure is going to haunt them. Do you think that he's making a mistake? Uh, I fear that he is. This is a man who is known internationally for his moral authority. Yes. And he did say that if he would ever have to, to relinquish his principles, he would withdraw from politics. Yes. But there, I think he did not relinquish his principles. If, if, he, if he would withdraw, people would say, he is a coward. Yeah? He let us in the mess. He left us in the mess. Yeah? On the other side, if he <laughs> complies, <laughs> people can say he, he was not uh, firm enough in his principles. Old friend Jerzy Dinspear is now head of the Civic Movement Party. He believes that Havel should be president again, but even Václav Havel needs more than principles. If Mr. Havel is without, if, if the president is without power, then he shouldn't be the president because he will be responsible for the policy of present Czech coalition without being able to influence it at all. Then it would be better if he goes from the castle to, to his country house and say like the girl, my dear, if you need me, you, you may find me there. It's been three years since the Velvet Revolution. In Wenceslas Square, the Havel to the castle posters are gone. 
replaced by Marlboro and McDonald's billboards and a lot of neon. This is a new country open for business. Is there room for the moral vision of a gentle revolutionary in the political reality of the new Czech state? The way I, I look at it is the, the Velvet Revolution of 1989 was like a morality play. The good guys were clear, the bad guys were clear. Havel was the great white knight on the white charger. Uh, he could do no wrong. But the situation that he's in now is like one of his own plays. That's the irony of it. A uh, play in which the, the hero is, uh, is, a, is a, a, a deeply troubled person in a morally ambiguous situation who doesn't really know what to do, who's put upon by people from all sides, who's constantly being importuned for help and advice, and uh, who does not really know the right way out of the situation. Don't you ever want to go back to your art, your books? Do you have some obligation to remain in politics? You might as well ask me why I had to be in prison for four and a half years when I didn't have to be there. It was my own decision. Yet I consciously went through it because I felt a kind of responsibility to do so. And it's the same now. I feel a responsibility to the work I have begun and to all those who would prefer to see me out of politics altogether. I'd rather not give them the pleasure of simply saying farewell and leaving the scene. You were a hero. Everyone thought you were going to bring peace, love, prosperity and moral authority to Czechoslovakia. Is it too late? <laughs> I think it's never too late for people to try and make the world a better place, as long as we're in this world.